Everybody else, take out your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts here this morning. Acts. We just finished a prolonged journey through the Gospel of Luke. But Luke's gospel is part of a, a series, you could say. He's, he's going to just carry the same line of thought right on through here into this study. So it'll almost be like we're in the same, the, the same vein of thought because we are. He wrote these two books. He wrote the gospel of Luke. Remember, Luke was not an apostle. Okay, Luke was, we're going to talk a little bit about him, but Luke was not one of the twelve. He was not... Not an apostle. He was a man who knew many of the twelve, no doubt, and had talked with them. But this morning we're going to introduce the man, we're going to introduce this book, and we're going to even just get into it a little ways here this morning. Let's start off talking about the author. Of course, I've already given it away. It's Luke, the, the beloved disciple, or the, I'm sorry, the beloved physician. Luke is the, the Greek word Lukos, or Lucas, as we would say here. And he is referred to only three times by name in the New Testament, twice as Lucas, one, once as Luke. The word Luke or Lucas means light-giving. It has the idea of something that's white, which if we wanted to, to uh, kind of explain on his name a little bit, we could say that there has certainly been a lot of light given over the years from those who have studied his writings. But when we get down to it, Scripture is largely silent. When it, when it comes to Luke's background, we don't know just a whole lot about him. Scholars believe uh, that he was originally from Antioch in Greece. So a Greek, which would also make him very likely a Gentile. So where most of the, the apostles were Jewish, Luke would have been a Gentile. So he's kind of coming at this, this Christianity, which at this time is something kind of new. He's kind of coming at it from a different perspective. And so it's very interesting, especially on Sunday evening as we're going through Galatians, we're getting the Apostle Paul's perspective on the gospel. And then you read in Luke and you have Luke's Gentile perspective on the same gospel. They're both preaching the same exact Christ, but having a Gentile perspective does help us. And I think very likely the vast majority of us in this room, probably Gentiles. And so as we look through this, this is written uh, and very much will, will communicate with us. We do know that Luke was a doctor. The reason we know this is because in Colossians 4, verse 14, again, one of only three times in the New Testament where he's mentioned by name, <clears throat> he is called Luke, the beloved physician. As in his gospel, Luke is prone to share details which is usually what you would expect from a doctor, right? When a doctor wants to say something, a doctor can take a sentence that should be this long, and by adding $4 words, they can make it this long sometimes, right? Well, Luke doesn't use a lot of $4 words, but he does have some tremendous insight, and he shares a lot of detail, which is one of the reasons I shared with you, Luke is one of my favorite books in the New Testament because of the detail that he shares. And the perspective that he gives. And he does the same exact thing as we carry on here into Acts. <clears throat> Being a doctor, Luke was an educated man. You, you can't be a doctor without learning something. Well, you would think. <laughs> Maybe you'd say, oh, I know the exception to that rule. Luke's not. Luke, Luke has done his homework. Luke, Luke was a man who was used of God, I believe. As we go through Acts, you'll see, I believe he was used of God to help treat some of the Apostle Paul's many uh, issues that he had over the years of ministry. Being a doctor and a highly educated man, the language that the apostle, or I'm sorry, that Luke uses is of a little bit higher caliber. He uses different words. When you read uh, the Gospel of John or 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he uses a very limited vocabulary. Why would John use a very limited vocabulary? Why would Peter use a very limited vocabulary? What were they by, by trade? Fishermen. Fishermen, right? They, just, they didn't have the education that someone like Luke did. Luke has a few more words in his arsenal, and he's going to use them to great advantage. He was a well-suited 
travel companion to the Apostle Paul, who was another highly educated man. While Luke would have been educated in the physical, the Apostle Paul was educated in the spiritual, right? The Apostle Paul grew up at the feet of Gamaliel, where Luke grew up in, in doctor school and grew up as understanding uh, the different things, perhaps as an apprentice to another doctor, would typically be how they would have learned in that time. In Acts 16, as you're reading through Acts, now we're going to be in Acts 1, but if you were to read, in Acts there are pronouns, and, and Luke uses the pronoun they, they, they. And when you get to Acts 16, suddenly it changes to we. And we can take from that that Luke joined the Apostle Paul in his travels and, uh, and was present with him. Luke's attention to detail and the way in which he lays those, de those details out is very thoughtful, very easily understood. His explanations are thorough, and he doesn't take for granted that we're coming from a tremendous knowledge, but he's writing this for somebody who he's introducing to Jesus. His writings are largely chronological, meaning what we read is coming in the order in which it happened. That's not always the case, but largely. So we know it's written by Luke. That's the author. Let's talk about the audience, just as we kind of introduce this new book. The audience is Theophilus. Look at verse 1. Anybody have the middle name Theophilus? Nobody. Okay. Verse 1, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, we'll deal with the former treatise in just a second, but the word Theophilus means friend of God. You hear Theo and you hear Philos, the two words put together. Theophilus, friend of God or loved by God, and we cannot be sure of who exactly this man was. Now, I'm going to give you some of the ideas, and I'm going to tell you the one that I want to be true, but I don't have any reason to assume that it is, but uh, fair warning, here are, here are a couple of different options that, that people have gotten over the years. In Luke 1, 3, Luke is writing, he addresses his gospel to the same person, and he calls him most excellent Theophilus. So, most excellent was a title. It was often used to address a Roman. And so for that reason, many believe that Luke was a Roman citizen, perhaps high-born, perhaps somebody who had a little bit, uh, or Theophilus was a, a, a Roman citizen, perhaps high-born, perhaps with a little bit of authority. And so Luke is writing his gospel, and now the book of Acts, he's writing it to this Roman, perhaps a Roman official. So that's one option. Another option, some believe that Theophilus was a Jew from Alexandria down in Egypt. Again, we, we, don't, have any, uh, we don't have any biblical reason to say that. This is my favorite one. Okay, so I'm going to give this to you. This is the one I kind of hope is true, but I don't know it to be true. You remember the high priest when Jesus was on trial? His name was Caiaphas. You remember that? Caiaphas, and then there was also his father-in-law's name was Annas. Okay, so you have Annas was the old high priest. Caiaphas was the, the next in line. Well, Caiaphas had a son. Can you guess what the son's name was? Theophilus. Wouldn't it be interesting if the son of the high priest of Israel, who eventually became high priest himself, was the recipient of this letter? We don't know that. And again, it, it, we don't have it on scripture, but there is a Theophilus in history who would have been there in that entire <clears throat> of time. Others believe that Theophilus is not a single person at all. It's a title. Many would say that this is all the people who will read Luke's writing. So say it this way, that the former treatise have I made unto thee all those who are loved of God. So some people would say that Theophilus is not one, but many, that all those who read it is that. So all the loved of God. You can take whichever you would like. Again, I think the Chia Caiaphas' son is kind of neat because of all that Caiaphas did. It would be neat if his son came to know the Lord after all of that. But let's carry on here and let's look at the purpose. Why is Luke writing this? It's not a gospel, but it's the continuing story. That's why he's writing. He started with, with Jesus Christ. 
Now, if you have your Bibles, you can turn back to Luke 1. I'm going to put it on the screen, but it's going to be small because of the amount I'm putting up there. In verse 1 of Acts 1, he says, The former treatise have I made, in that he's referring to his gospel, the gospel of Luke. At the beginning of his gospel, here's what Luke gave as the purpose for writing his gospel. He said, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which, have most, which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, okay, so this is his purpose. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Why did Luke write his gospel? Well, he wanted to, remember, he's a doctor, he's an educated man, he says, look, I want to take all of the, all of the, the story of Jesus, and I want to put it down in an orderly fashion so that we can know the surety of, of the accounts of Jesus Christ. So that's what he wrote his gospel for. And he carries that, that purpose right on into his writing of the book of Acts. Acts is merely the continuing story. Jesus Christ uh, ascends back to heaven. Luke ends with the resurrection and the ascension. But then what happened? Well, he picks that up in the book of Acts. His gospel ends with the ascension. Acts begins at the ascension. Now, I want to give you a note here. Now, I understand this is a little bit more teachy than preachy, perhaps, up to this point. I'm going to, I'm going to start preaching in a minute. But we're introducing a new book, so I need to give you some information. I need you to hear me on this, okay? Because this is something that will help us as we go through the rest of the book of Acts. Acts is historical narrative. It is not a pastoral epistle. What's an epistle? You remember? It's not the life of an apostle, okay? An epistle is the writing of an apostle, okay? Or of a, a man who was greatly used of God, not always an apostle, but a, a, a letter that was written most times to a church or to the pastor of a church to inform on doctrine, okay? The book of Acts is not a pastoral epistle. It's a historical narrative. When you go into the Old Testament and you go to First and Second Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, those are historical books, okay? They're telling how it happened in that time. The book of Acts is also historical narrative. I'm not saying that we can't learn doctrine from Acts, but the, in, in, in parallel with that thought that it is not an epistle but historical narrative, Acts is largely descriptive rather than prescriptive. Let me explain. This is going to tell us about the birth of the church. This is going to tell us how things were in the early church. But we are not to look nor pattern ourselves here in this church after everything that happened in the book of Acts. Okay? There are some differences. Notably, angelic meetings. <laughs> there were lots of meetings where people were talking to angels and seeing angels and following angels. If you, when we get to Acts chapter 5, uh, you remember Ananias and Sapphira? You remember what happened to them? I know it's, we're not there yet. They lied, right? And what happened when Ananias and Sapphira died? They dropped dead right there. Right there okay? And what did, the, what did the deacons do? Well, they came forward and they gathered up. Ananias, and they hauled him out and they buried him. And a few hours later, his wife came in, Sapphira. She lied too. She dropped dead right in the same place her husband had. What did the deacons do? They came forward and they gathered her up and they carried her out and they buried her. Deacons, are you glad that we are not living in the book of Acts? Okay? <laughs> There's a reason. It's, it's descriptive. It's not prescriptive. It's not telling us this is what your church service must look like. And I know you're all thankful for that because in Acts 20... We're going to read that the Apostle Paul's message went till midnight, okay? So, take it for what you may. If you, if you want, we can go for it sometime, and we'll, we'll just see how, we'll do a marathon message, and we'll go till midnight. But if you remember, in Acts 20, his message went so long that a young man fell asleep, 
and fell out of a window and died. You remember that? So I'm not, I don't, I don't guess I'll do that. But I, I do want you to know the book of Acts, as we're going through, it's historical narrative. And it's not describing how our church must look in every detail. But in essence, it's what our church should be like. Our, the church, the first church, was led by the Holy Spirit. We should be led by the Holy Spirit. But it's going to look different today than it did then in some respects. So I want to want to put that out there. The book of Acts is a transitional book. It's the beginning of the church. They didn't have the whole Bible where we do. They still had the apostles who were working miracles and all of that. That's going to be happening in the book of Acts. If you look at the title in your Bible, as in mine, it probably says the Acts of the Apostles. More accurately, it could say the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Okay, Because nothing that the Apostles do through here that is of lasting value was done in their own power. It is all done through the power and through the enabling of the Holy Spirit. So as we go through here, we're going to pick up on that. Let's start off. Here in verse 1. Acts 1, verse 1, with the promise of power. That was a long introduction, okay? We're going we're gonna to get right in. Uh, the, the message won't be twice as long as the introduction, I promise. Acts 1, verse 1. We start off with the promise of power in verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, speaking of his gospel, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. <coughs> now as we went through the Gospel of Luke and the accounts of the crucifixion, we dealt with each of the sayings from the cross. Do you remember this? As we went through the, we would call it the Passion Week, and then when we got to the crucifixion, we went and we took all of the Gospels together and kind of gave a parallel account. We looked at all seven of Christ's sayings that he made from the, from the cross. And one of the reasons that I gave as we did that is that last words are important. If you've ever been at the bedside of a loved one or of anyone who is getting ready to pass out into eternity, most of the time... You're listening. You want to hear. Do they say anything? Because why? Well, because last words matter. You want to hear what that person has to say. And I'm not minimizing the importance of Jesus' words from the cross. There's <clears throat> much that we can learn from them. But were the seven sayings of Christ on the cross his last words? No. No, Jesus... Remember, he was only dead for three days and three nights, and then he rose from the dead, and he had much to say. Jesus had many interactions and conversations with his disciples. You remember, it was 40 days from when Jesus rose from the dead until Jesus ascended back to the Father. So in that just over a month, he said many things. Some of them we have recorded for us at the end of the Gospels. But he was very, very busy talking and sharing truth. And again, showing his disciples what we just read by many infallible proofs that he was in fact alive. Why did he have to show them by many infallible proofs? Well, because at first they didn't believe. Do you remember exactly how it went? They, they, Jesus appeared in their midst and he said, what was his first two words to them? Fear. No, why? Well, because the last time they'd seen him, he'd been dead. And here he is alive in our midst. So Jesus had to prove to them that he was literally, physically alive. How did, how did Thomas come to believe? He touched him, right? They, they, all, they all spoke with him. They all saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. He ate to prove that he was, in fact, uh, uh, flesh, that he was a physical being, okay? He had many interactions. And during that time, verse 2 tells us that he gave them commandments. The word commandments is what you would give in a military operation. It's the, the last words of your commanding officer before you go out, okay? That's what this word is. So in the 40 days after the resurrection, 
before the ascension, Jesus is giving his, his final marching orders to the disciples. He's telling them, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out, and I want you to do it this way. Verse 3 tells us that Jesus was speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Look at it there in verse 3. Speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now this talk right here of the kingdom of God would have excited the disciples. Okay, As we were going through Luke, did you pick up on the fact that these guys kind of had a one-track mind when it came to the kingdom? Okay, They were often arguing amongst themselves who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. So... After the, the resurrection, Jesus starts talking to them about the kingdom, and these guys kind of get excited, okay, because they're patriots. They, they love their country. They're Jews, all of them. They're, they're patriotic. They're excited that, that maybe now, after three years of some ups and downs, maybe now Jesus is going to establish his earthly kingdom. So when Jesus starts talking about that, all of the disciples, they're getting kind of giddy inside. This, this could be it, guys. He's going to do it. But Jesus isn't talking about the establishment of his physical earthly kingdom at that time. The disciples understood the cross by this point. They understood the resurrection. But the kingdom was still just a little bit fuzzy. They looked at it as, well, now that we've had the cross, now that you've redeemed man... Now you can set up your kingdom. That was what their thought was. Where is the kingdom of God right now? Well, a kingdom is wherever a king's rule is noticed. And where is the rule of Christ noticed right now? It, it should be right here. <laughs> In my heart, the kingdom of God exists within me. Why? Because I'm a child of God. Because I've trusted in Jesus Christ. And so the kingdom of God, where he rules, is within me. Now, that's not to say that he's not going to set up an earthly kingdom. He is. He absolutely is. But not yet. Until he comes and he establishes his earthly kingdom, the kingdom is within me and within you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. In 2023, the lost world around us, they follow the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world, or he goes by lots of names, Satan. He's the one who rules over the children of disobedience. But in the, in the heart of those of us who have asked Jesus to save us from our sins, those of us who have, who have by faith been born again into the family of God, the, the kingdom of God exists right here, right now, within me. Romans 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? The, the world, who do they follow? Well, they follow, they follow their flesh. They follow Satan. Who, who do we as believers follow? Who should we obey? Well, we would say, I'm a, ser I'm a servant of Jesus. <clears throat> Are you? A am I? Am I a servant of Jesus? Because Jesus gives a warning in Luke 6, 46. He says, and why call ye me Lord? Lord, and do not the things that I say. You, you and I, you, let's, you're here this morning, you say, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'm confident of that fact. I know without a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die today, I would be absent from the body. I would be present with the Lord. He's Lord of my life. Okay, I hear you, but, but do you obey? Do you, you call him Lord, but is he Lord? You, you can say, well, yeah, Jesus is Lord of my life, but I kind of like to call the shots. Then who's actually Lord of your life? You. You're trying to be, but who are you ultimately? You're ultimately, you're going to follow the world, the flesh, and the devil because that's the alternative. You're either going to, you've heard maybe a little poem says, only two choices on the shelf, serving God or serving self. That's it. That's it. Are you a servant of God? Is the kingdom of God in you this morning? Does he call the shots? Jesus was preparing his disciples. He's got 40 days to give them their verbal communication. 
40 days to prepare his disciples to go into the world to declare the gospel of redemption, to expand the kingdom of God within the hearts of whosoever would accept him by faith. That's the neat thing about the kingdom of God. When I meet a, a lost person and that person's under conviction and, and I get to share the gospel with that person and through the miracle of the Holy Spirit's conviction and God's word working in them, that person trusts Christ. And what happens to the kingdom of God? It expands just a little bit more and a little bit more. In every person who trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, the flag goes up on a new, on a new front. The kingdom of God is expanding. Again, the, the real question is, is my heart genuine where, where he rules supreme? Or, or do I try to push him off the throne and sit there myself and say, well, I, I, I can handle it here more. Jesus has some additional instructions for them. Look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Luke, here in Acts 1, is rehearsing the events on the day that Christ ascended in Luke 24. He's, he's going back and he's, he's just rehashing this, this, what Jesus said to his disciples there on the Mount of Olives. This, this is, is what Jesus said. Luke 24, 49 says, and behold, here's, here's how I phrased it in Luke, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Here he says who the power is. The power is the Holy Spirit. And you'll be baptized with him not many days hence is the word that he uses here in verse 5. Jesus ascended back to the Father from the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is just to the east of Jerusalem. And his instruction to his disciples as they're standing there on the Mount of Olives, remember they watch him ascend as they're listening to him speak. And then the, the, the angels came down and, and said, why are you looking up? The same Jesus, is, he's coming back in like manner. Okay? But Jesus' instructions to them were not to immediately go start spreading the gospel. He said, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. So take the, take the short trip to the west over the Kidron Valley and, and go into Jerusalem. And I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. He promised that following the ascension, the Holy Spirit would come and enable them for the task before them. John 16, Jesus said it this way. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. According to this verse, what is better, and this would be awesome, would it be how awesome would it be? How tremendous would it be if we had Jesus standing right here? Would that be great? Wow, that would be something. But according to this verse, what's better for us? It's better for us that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father preparing a place for us because in his, in his absence, and he's with us, but in his absence, Physical absence. He's not here in physical form. We have the Holy Spirit of God. Where does the Holy Spirit of God dwell? He, he dwells in me. And he dwells in you. And he dwells in you. And he dwells in, he dwells in all of us. So what happened to Jesus when he was here on earth? Okay? When Jesus was walking in leather sandals around Galilee, he was in one place at a time. When Jesus was in Capernaum, he wasn't in Jerusalem. When he, when he was in Bethesda, he, he wasn't in, in Samaria, okay? Jesus was in one place at a time when he was physically here. Where is he now after he ascended to the Father? He's, he's within me and within you, and he's on the other side of the world inside of believers there. The, the presence of God multiplied. The power of God in the person of the Holy Spirit multiplied. That's why he says... The works that I do shall ye do, and greater works shall ye do. Okay, that's here in John 16. 
Jesus is promising a baptism of the Spirit here in verse 5. Take a look at it. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The word baptize is the Greek word baptizo. Okay? I have an asterisk up here because this is what's called a transliteration. Meaning they didn't find the English word, they just translated the, the Greek word into English. The Greek word is baptizo, the English word is baptize. So they just, they brought one into the other. The word baptizo means to immerse, to dump, to place under. So, he's saying, just like John immersed in water, <coughs> you are going to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, not many days hence. You're going to be completely overwhelmed with the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll speak of this in more detail when we come to Acts 2, because that's when it happened. But this is one of the differences between the transitional period described in Acts and our experience today. The, the disciples, they had already trusted in Jesus. They were justified, but they didn't receive the Holy Spirit until Acts 2. Okay? That's not how it happens today. Now, when we trust Jesus Christ, we are placed into Christ and we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. That's, that's what God says here in his word. We look in Romans. We'll take a look. Romans, well, we'll get there in a, in a few moments. But in Romans 6, he speaks of, of the fact that as many of us as are baptized into Jesus Christ are baptized into his death, that we receive the Holy Ghost. <coughs> Now that's pretty neat truth that we just read. Look what the disciples thought of it in verse 6. Okay, Jesus was just sharing tremendous truth, promises of God. And what do they say? When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> again, these guys are kind of one-note Johnnies, right? Lord, we heard what you said about the Holy Spirit coming, but you're going to restore the kingdom now, right? Right? Is he going to restore the kingdom now? Is he at this time going to establish his earthly... No. He's going to expand the kingdom within the hearts of his disciples and within those who trust him. But the patriotic disciples, they're anxious for Jesus to establish himself as king of a new Jewish empire. All through the Gospels, the disciples had been fixated on this. They kept coming back to it. Jesus would, would do some tremendous miracles or would speak some tremendous truth. And the disciples were in the back arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. This came up again and again and again. Look at verse 7. Jesus responds. And he saith, said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. The literal earthly kingdom of God will be established in Jerusalem following the second coming of Christ. When will the second coming be? I can speak definitively and authoritatively on when the, when the second coming will be. Are you ready for this? Okay, I'm going to give you a verse. Here it comes. Matthew 5, 13. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Okay, so definitively, from Scripture, when is the, when is the second coming? Everybody go like this. I don't know. But why? Because God said you don't know. Meaning, if somebody gets up and they say, I know when Jesus is coming back. I added up the age of all of the, all of the high priests and divided it by the number of minor prophets and times it by Daniel 70 weeks, and it gave me a day. What, what must we assume about someone who would say that? They're wrong. Why? Because God said so in his word. Another place, Mark 13, 32. But that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. <coughs> nobody knows when Jesus is going to return. So nobody knows with precision when, uh, when the kingdom is going to be established. We cannot know the exact time of the events that will set in motion the establishment of the kingdom. 
Therefore, we should be busy. And, and what should we busy ourselves with? Because as we wait for the kingdom, the disciples were waiting for the kingdom. We're waiting for the kingdom. What should we be doing? Acts 1.8. Look at it. Here it is. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come <clears throat> upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. What do we call this? This is called the Great Commission. Okay? We find it in all four Gospels. We find it here in Acts. While we're waiting for the kingdom, while we're waiting for Jesus to set the end times in motion, what should we be doing? We should be witnessing. We should be spreading the gospel. We should be spreading the kingdom of God within the hearts of men here on earth. That's what we need to be doing. Jesus declared in Matthew 28, verse 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And here in Acts 1, verse 8, he says, But ye shall receive power. Jesus has all the power to give, and Jesus says, I'm going to give it to you for a purpose. Why is he going to give us power? To fulfill the commission. He's going to give us power to obey. When he was walking through the hills around Jerusalem, Jesus never lacked the power to do and say anything. He could do what he wanted because he's God. And he could, he could speak the gospel to each and every one. Jesus promised his disciples that by the power of the Holy Spirit, who would indwell them, that they would also never lack the power to say and do the things that the Father desired. This verse right here, Acts 1.8, this is the key to the whole book of Acts. Everything that we see going forward in the, in the chapters to follow, in the days and weeks, it all comes back to Acts 1.8. We're going to see this commission fulfilled. Notice quickly the expanding nature of the commission. He says, in Jerusalem, we have the map here of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's, that's where they were. Okay, Jerusalem, Judea, that's a little bit bigger. Samaria, a little bit bigger. That includes some undesirables. The Jews didn't particularly like the Samaritans. And unto the uttermost parts of the earth. On a map this scale, the United States would be quite a long way in that direction. Okay? But they were to take the gospel everywhere they could. They were to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. They would be witnesses. The word witness is the word martus, from which we get the word martyr which is somebody who gives credence to their testimony by dying for them. And all but one of the apostles, John was the only exception, would die violent deaths preaching the name of Jesus Christ. How were these 11, soon to be 13 men, going to accomplish this all by themselves? That's a trick question. How are they going to accomplish this all by themselves? They're not going to accomplish it by themselves. They're only going to accomplish it through the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, they're not going to get it done. They need the promised power to enable them to stand against persecution, libel, slander, religious opposition, language barriers, imprisonment, physical abuse, and we're going to read about all of it. We're going to stop right there. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. We spoke about the kingdom of God. Does Christ reign uncontested as king in your life? Or do you still call the shots? Because if you're still calling the shots, then he's not Lord of your life. If you say, well, I know what God's word says, but... No, there's a problem. I know what God says, God's word says, and I will obey is the only position that we should take. Am I the one who calls him Lord, but then doesn't obey the commands he's given me in his word? I hope not. Are you involved in the expansion of the kingdom of God? That's what the commission was to the disciples. That's what the commission is to us as well. Each soul who comes to Christ by faith is another victory and another expansion of the kingdom of God here right now. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, 
You've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. That's what his word tells us. You have within you the same Holy Spirit who indwelt Paul and Peter and John and James. Romans 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The commission that we will see carried out in the coming weeks and months was not complete. <coughs> they didn't get the job all the way done. There are still millions of people who haven't heard the gospel today, and you know lots of them. You walk past lots of them. You're going to walk past people this week who've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you going to tell them? Am I going to tell them? Are you going to take the time to obey the commission for which you've been empowered? What steps are you taking to get the gospel to your Jerusalem, to your Judea, to your Samaria? What steps are you taking to get the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth? Why do you think we support missions? Because I can't be everywhere at once, so we send others to, to speak the gospel. Are you involved in, in this greatest of tasks that God has given to us? Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? As we get started into the book of Acts, I hope that you'll be prepared for all that lies before us. There's a lot of tremendous truth, a lot of promises, a lot of stories that maybe you're not as familiar with. But underwriting all of that is this is the story of men and women who were, who were filled with the Spirit, who couldn't get over what Jesus Christ had done for them. And they... We'll see in Acts 17, they turned the world upside down for the cause of Christ. We need to do the same. I trust that you'll allow the Lord to use you to do so. Our Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises. Lord, we thank you for the commands because you give us the power in which to obey them. I pray, Lord, that we would be found faithful as we have opportunity, as we seek opportunity. To share the gospel. Lord I pray. That there wouldn't be one here this morning. Who claims you as savior. Who does not allow you. To, to lead. And, and have the rule in their life. Who's trying to wrest that control from you. Lord I pray. If there's one here this morning. Who hasn't trusted you as savior. I pray that they wouldn't leave this place. Before they get that settled. Amen. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.